For every F-35 Joint Strike Fighter or F-22 Raptor that makes it into service, there's a list of competitor fighters that didn't make the cut for one reason or another. Sometimes these fighters get left behind because Uncle Sam picked the better competitor, but that's not always how these decisions are made. Let's dive into the five fighters America should have gotten. I'm Alex Hollings, and this is Air Power. Right off the bat, I want to be clear that this list is pretty subjective. There is a ton that goes into the fighter acquisition process, and you could really write a book about each one of these programs. So while I speak in broad strokes about the incredible potential some of these platforms had, I want to be clear that I'm leaving a lot of the nuance on the table just for the sake of time, and there are certainly arguments to be made that Uncle Sam made the right call when he chose the fighters we have today. In some ways, this is a list of fighters I wish we could have put in production alongside many of the jets that are operating today, but that's obviously just not feasible. Like all military forces, the U.S. has to balance capability against capacity. In other words, it doesn't matter if you have 300 of the most advanced fighters on the planet if you need at least 500 to accomplish your mission. So defense officials have to balance the cost of the fighters' advanced capabilities against their capacity, or the number of fighters they need to meet their defense obligations. In this example, it might mean only purchasing 100 of those advanced fighters alongside 400 100 cheaper or less capable platforms that can meet the mission requirements we have at hand. The F-15EX is a great example of what I mean. From an American perspective, in a perfect world, we wouldn't need fighter jets at all. But in a perfect budgetary world, we'd be able to field strictly the most advanced stealth fighters in the world and nothing else. But we don't live in either of those worlds, and in order to meet the defense obligations the Air Force has to this nation, it needs more fighters than it can afford to operate F-35s. And as a result, F-15EXs are being purchased to replace dated F-15Cs and Ds that at one time were going to be replaced by F-22s. But it's not always this question of simple arithmetic that ultimately puts a fighter into production or not. Sometimes fighter programs don't survive because the Defense Department doesn't have faith in the contractor to deliver on what they promise, or because the capabilities offered by the aircraft aren't ones the nation has a pressing need for at the time. But for whatever reason, these are the fighters that didn't make it into production. But if they had, they would have offered some incredible and often unique capabilities. Up first is the F-16XL. Back in 1977, about three years after the first F-16 took flight and one year before it would enter service, its designer began working on what would come to be called the F-16 Supersonic Cruise and Maneuver Prototype, or SCAMP. The effort wasn't about fielding another production fighter. General Dynamics had no intention of trying to sell SCAMP once it was complete. Instead, the whole premise behind the program was to quickly and cheaply field a platform they could use to test the concept behind super cruising. Now, super cruising or supersonic cruising is just the ability to maintain supersonic speeds without the use of your afterburner, so you can keep more of your fuel in reserve. In order to accomplish this goal, the F-16 needed a pretty thorough revamp. First, the wings were modified to incorporate a cranked aero delta shape, and that added 25% more lift. Working in conjunction with NASA and using the company's own funds, engineer Harry Hilliker, the same man responsible for the original design, kept experimenting with slight variations on the wings until they came to one they really liked that they dubbed the Model 400. This new wing design saw a 50-degree angle near the root of the wing for supersonic performance and a 70-degree angle where the wings extended for subsonic handling, and it offered more than double the surface area of the F-16's original wings. 
Tests went so well for the F-16 Scamp that the Air Force got interested and provided them with two early F-16A airframes to modify into what they dubbed the F-16XL. And with the massive wings now fully realized, it gave the F-16XL nearly double the fuel capacity of the original F-16, with a great deal of additional lift thanks to 633 square feet of underwing space, which they then leveraged for an astonishing 27 hardpoints for small diameter bombs. All told, the F-16XL could conduct air-to-surface missions while carrying twice the payload of a standard F-16 while still flying as much as 44% further without any need for external fuel tanks and while still carrying a full suite of air-to-air -air weapons, four AMRAMs and two AIM-9s at the time. And lest you think all that hate would slow it down, you'd actually be wrong. The F-16XL, thanks to improved aerodynamics, could actually fly 83 knots faster than the F-16 a at sea level under military power, and 300 knots faster at high altitudes under full afterburner. It was even rated for a higher G-load than the F-16A was. This experiment that was never meant to go into production proved so capable that the Air Force actually entered it into the Enhanced Tactical Fighter competition that would ultimately produce the F-15E Strike Eagle, which was probably the right choice, but the F-16XL could have been a very cool complement to the Strike Eagle today. Up next is the McDonnell Douglas A-12 Avenger II, which would have actually been America's first real stealth fighter had it gone into production. Meant to serve aboard aircraft carriers, the A-12 Avenger II would have been a bit more than 37 feet long, with a wingspan around 70 feet. Now, just to be clear, that's big for an aircraft carrier. It's about six feet wider than the Tomcat's wingspan, but the Navy was pretty confident that they could place two of these aircraft side by side on adjacent catapults on their carriers. The A-12 would have had a flying wing design, sort of like the B-2 Spirit, but with a much more triangular shape that earned it the nickname the Flying Dorito. Now, the A-12 wouldn't have been very fast, with an expected top speed of around 680 knots, but it would have had onboard fire control radar, which is something the F-117 lacked, making it capable of air-to-air -air combat. It would also carry AGM-88 Harm missiles into the fight, effectively going in and wiping out air defenses ahead of fourth-generation fighters. By the time this program was canceled in January of 1991, it was already way overweight, way over budget and way behind schedule. It obviously wasn't the best program, but it makes it onto this list because after its cancellation, it would take more than two and a half more decades before the Navy would finally get a stealth fighter onto its flat tops. Up next is the YF-12, which you may know as the SR-71's missile packing sibling. The YF-12 bore a striking resemblance to its A-12 and SR-71 family, but it had a second cockpit added for a fire control officer tasked with managing its air-to-air -air arsenal, and it also had a Hughes ANASG-18 fire control radar added to the nose. But the most important difference was probably how it leveraged its four payload bays. One of the bays was converted to house fire control equipment, while the others were modified to house an internal payload of three Hughes AIM-47 Falcon air-to-air -air missiles, which were the direct predecessors to the AIM-54 Phoenix that would eventually come to fame with the F-14 Tomcat. At one point, the Air Force had placed an order for 93 of these aircraft, which it dubbed the F-12B, and according to its designer, famed Lockheed engineer Kelly Johnson, they had a very high success rate, with scoring hits using the AIM-47 in test flights in excess of Mach 3. Officially, it was Russia's success at developing ICBMs, reducing the need for high-speed interceptors to stop their heavy payload bombers that ultimately killed the YF-12. But according to Kelly Johnson, it was worries about it competing with the XB-70 Valkyrie for funding. Who you believe is up to you. Up next is the ASF-14 Super Tomcat, and I have been tempted to say this next one is my favorite a few times on this list already, but I think the ASF-14 really might be. 
There were a few different proposals to modernize the Grumman F-14 Tomcat for continued service into the 21st century, including the ST-21 and AST-21 proposals, which were really updates for the Navy's existing Tomcat fleet that could have included the purchase of a few additional airframes. But the ASF-14 would have been something different. It would have been an entirely new aircraft that shared a lot of design cues with the original Tomcat, in much the same way the FA-18E and F Super Hornets were entirely new aircraft that just shared design cues with the Hornet, really to trick people into thinking they were more cost-effective. The ASF-14 would have been powered by a pair of GE F-110-129 engines, which were an improvement over the GE F-110s, which were already a dramatic improvement over the Tomcat's original and troublesome TF-30s. And thanks to these improvements, alongside a number of aerodynamic changes, the ASF SF-14 would have offered more speed, more range, and the ability to supercruise at a jaw-dropping Mach 1.3. There was even a proposal to incorporate thrust vector control, which allows the pilot to orient the outflow of the engine independent of the aircraft itself, which allows for some incredibly aerobatic maneuvering. The existing Tomcat had variable wing geometry that was controlled by an onboard computer for maximum benefit and handling, which allowed this massive incomplete comparison fighter to even outturn the F-16 under some very specific circumstances. The addition of thrust vector control would have improved the F-14's angle of attack capabilities, and also probably made it among the most aerobatic fighters of its era, and certainly of its size. And because these were new-build fighters, they wouldn't be saddled with any of the dated equipment and technology filling the fuselages of the Navy's existing F-14s, which meant it could not only be lighter, but it could carry more fuel, while reducing both maintenance requirements and costs. The aircraft that could have been the ASF-14 would have offered some 60,000 pounds of thrust and a better thrust-to-weight ratio than the F-14D, thrust vector control, massive internal fuel stores, huge payload capabilities, and incredible situational awareness provided by a powerful onboard and updated radar, and a multitude of sensor pods that could be mounted where oil coolers for the early iteration Phoenix missiles used to sit. All told, it could have been the most capable fourth generation fighter in the world. And as an F-15 fanboy, I don't say that lightly. There are a lot of strong opinions out there about why the Navy ultimately chose the Super Hornet over the ASF-14. The official story is basically that the ASF-14, despite being cheaper to maintain than the older Tomcats, would still have been very expensive. In a lot of ways, the Super Hornet was the economical Honda Accord to the ASF-14's Ferrari, and after the fall of the Soviet Union, there just wasn't any looming reason for a very expensive long-range intercept fighter on America's flat tops. But this decision wasn't all economics, there was also a lot of politics involved, and in fact, I covered the F-14 for Popular Mechanics a bit ago, and I recently received a package in the mail from a former Navy official outlining all the ways they made the wrong choice. But I'm not here to hate on the Super Hornet, it's actually a very capable fighter. In fact, the F-A-18 Super Hornet is the only American fighter to have an air-to-air -air kill in better than 20 years. And while it may not have the speed or the range of the Tomcat or the ASF-14, it does have a much smaller radar profile, which in today's world isn't a bad thing. But I'll stop qualifying my love for the ASF-14 and move on to what may well be your favorite aircraft on this list, the fan-favorite Northrop YF-23. In today's world, the Lockheed Martin F-22 Raptor is the reigning king of the skies, but for a short time in the 90s, it may have met its match in the form of Northrop's entry for the Advanced Tactical Fighter competition, the YF-23. The YF-23 came with a pretty unconventional design for its day, and even still today. It had diamond-shaped wings to reduce its radar signature, and a cockpit pushed way forward on the airframe for improved visibility. On the back, its all-moving V-tail not only reduced its radar signature further, it also gave it incredible maneuverability despite not having the thrust vector control found in its YF-22 competitor. According to reports, the YF-23 could nearly match the F-22's aerobatic performance, even without thrust vector control. It also offered an overall stealthier profile and significantly more range. 
In the years since the ATF competition, many have come to believe that Lockheed won not by fielding the best aircraft, but by offering the most dynamic demonstration of its capabilities, and thanks to the perception among Air Force leaders that Lockheed could deliver what it was offering on time and on budget, which wasn't something Northrop was known for at the time. Of course, today, Lockheed Martin isn't exactly known for its fighter aircraft being on time or on budget, and Northrop's B-21 program continues to be both. But hindsight is 2020. The truth is, whether the Air Force chose the YF-22 or the YF-23, the result would have been an incredibly capable platform with no peers anywhere on the world stage. But in a perfect budgetary world, it would have been pretty cool to watch them fly together. And that does it for yet another edition of Air Power from Sandbox News. But I really want you guys to tell me what you thought of this video. If you like these sorts of lists, I can do more of them. And this is the first time I've ever tried doing a video without a really concrete script in front of me. If you guys want to learn more about each of these aircraft, I actually have videos about most of them and articles about them all. I'll include links down below. And now for my outro spiel. I'm Alex Hollings. Make sure you swing by sandboxnews.com today and every day for all the latest in news, entertainment, and motivation from all around the force. If you got anything out of today's video, make sure to click like and subscribe down below and leave me a comment so I know what I should cover next. And of course, don't forget to tap on that bell icon so you never miss a drop from Sandbox News.